look at the fact that that would be concrete ties and continuous welded rail. It's a more rigid structure. I'm not an engineer. I get too much more into it. I'm going to have to call the engineer up here. But um, the it's more rigid, so that would actually help to mitigate the, the noise and vibration issue. And again, the traffic that is operating on one track today would be operating on double track. So if you were able to redo the track that we have now with a better constructed track, that would make the noise and vibration issues uh, be reduced? I can't say that with certainty. It, again, that's not my area of expertise. But when you look at um, the questions of the additional vibration and noise with the, the mm -hmm. additional four miles of track, um, some concerns that we've heard is that when you, when you operate two trains at a time, for example, through that area, isn't that going to double the noise and, and double compound it? Um, this is not how it works when you hear a, a loud clanging and then a second loud clanging. You don't have a, a double compounded noise, right? You have noise. So um, it's one of the things that it's not a sophisticated <laughs> explanation for you, but um, th that's the the answer. Is that it's it's not a, a doubling of noise and vibration in the area. All right. Well, I have one more question, just so that I can get this figured out. People complain about the starting and stopping. And I guess is I guess that's because of increased traffic. I, I do want to address that. Thank you for uh, for and Joe and on the operating side could come up here as well. The uh, the other benefit of this project is less less of that occurring because there is additional track for traffic to be moving on. When you talk about less impact or, or reduced impact at grade crossings because of this bottleneck being more fluid because of the additional miles of track, it's, it's a similar effect in terms of stopping and starting. And some of that certainly would still occur, but it would be reduced as a result of this. I don't know if you want to. So it's important to realize that um, certainly on both sides of town there are constraints where two tracks come into one. Certainly that's one of the things that the project would address where both tracks would traverse next to each other for a longer distance. I think it's important to recognize that if the concern is about noise, stopping and starting a train, there are lots of things that go on. But personally, being a locomotive engineer myself and having done that um, in a prior life prior to this, I will tell you that, that certainly you know, the, the slack coming out of the train causes quite a bit of noise. There's a lot of vibration and things that go along with that. A uh, train that stopped, you know, with a locomotive will certainly cause noise. Can I tell you um, categorically that it causes less noise? When the train's in motion, I've stood next to trains, directly next to trains as they're in motion, and they can be awful quiet, I can tell you that. Uh, but starting and stopping the train can be a noisy business, for sure. So currently, there's a lot of starting and stopping of trains right now as trains are going through? Most certainly in the, in the track that I'm responsible for, if you consider just the general crossing, there is stopping and starting going on south of town, south of Grab, and north of town, Sullivan. So certainly in those areas, stopping and starting, there's quite a bit. I wouldn't say that directly in the city of Lacrosse, there's quite a bit of stopping and starting. Relative to those two locations, it's, it's less. Well, I, I just want to kind of explain the only reason. I'm asking this question to try to understand because I'm hearing from constituents who are saying, we lived by the train track before and it didn't bother us. Now we're having problems with a lot of vibration, a lot of noise, and keeping us up at night. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's the change, what's, what has happened. I, I'm guessing it's increased tra train traffic. And now my, I guess, my question is, it seems like with the second track we're going to have even, I mean, aside from the safety issues, aside from you know, the other things that people are concerned about, with two tracks, we're going to have more of the train noise and vibration problems. And that's what I'm trying to understand. You know, if that's true or if that's not true or if that's a speculation or, sure. you know, if there's been studies done or, you know, things like that. I certainly can't speak to any specific study. I have never heard of that, but I, I will say that not knowing the direct location of that stopping and starting would be very hard to say. Um, certainly the sensitivity of the issue, naturally, we're very sensitive to the issue as are you. Certainly the perceptions of those things could increase, you know, but, but to not know the exact location that you're talking about, it'd be very hard for me to say, okay, there's more trains there or less that are stopping and starting, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. And the other piece of that I would just add, too, is, is um, if you look at returning traffic volumes on the railroad uh, that you see here and in many other parts of our network, in terms of overall return,
we're turning volumes back to those uh, more similar to those 2006 levels uh, than what you would have seen when you look at 2009, 2010, for example. Who's supposed to come here? We're, we're still at them yet with our three minute rebuttal. So, any other questions of the speakers? Uh, Council Member Sikoski. Uh, thank you. Um, and hopefully this won't take too long. But um, one of the previous speakers um, had discussed the environmental mitigation process with the Army Corps of Engineers and also the DNR. From my understanding, then, that uh, there's really no guarantee that mitigation will occur in the lacrosse area, but rather funding is distributed to projects around the state. Is BNSF able to offer any mitigation specifically to the lacrosse area? Yeah, the, um, about two years ago, the state legislature, the governor passed a new piece of legislation that is now just being implemented, and that sets up a statewide trust fund and so when rail projects like that plan here, where there needs to be an offset somewhere, um, where you can't find an actual wetlands to offset it, maybe offset it, um, you would say it contributes to the trust fund. And that, that's, as, as Doug um, indicated, that's the preferred system that both the Corps of Engineers and the DNR wants. And so the dollars that, that I believe, I guess I can say the number, it looks like we, we may have contributed somewhere between six and $700,000 into this trust fund. And that trust fund then will be used for projects anywhere in the state, not necessarily across. But it means that communities like across, if you've got a project in here that you'd like that to see that those kinds of dollars go to, you have to submit an application to DNR, probably call your state legislators and, and ask them to put some pressure on DNR that you've got a great project here that they'd like to um, that, that would like you to like that funded. So that's the preferred system that we're going with. It's it's new, as I said. Um, the Corps of Engineers has to approve the plan that DNR is putting together, and that plan is before the Corps now for the review. We anticipate it's going to get approved, and then that's how it will work from um, this point going forward. Just, just to follow up with that, so then does that offer any direct mitigation to the cross area? So I missed the first part of what you said. Does that offer any direct mitigation to the cross area? Not the DNR sets up the program that they're, uh, they, they have a certain number of credits that are pre approved in this program that they're developing right now. And the state is divided up into several watersheds, and there are a certain number of credits within each watershed. And the DNR has identified potential projects that they will use for conservation efforts using the funds within that watershed. I don't know specifically what the projects are for this watershed, whether they're in across or not. But the way the program is set up is when the applicant pays the fee to the program, it's up to the DNR to decide what they do with the fund, and the applicant's obligation is required <coughs> at that point. We have talked to the DNR about the process, you know, desires to have mitigation here, and they've considered that, but they have their process. Okay, any other questions of the speakers? So now I would like to turn it over to the other side. Who would